for uh, introducing today's topic and uh, and speaker, uh, I draw your attention to forthcoming events. Uh, a little bit later in this month, there should be a colloquium by Lieberger from University of Wittfassesrand on paleoanthropology. And uh, later in June this year, we shall have a colloquium by Xavier Vienthal from CEA Grenoble on quantum computing. Uh, also, uh, uh, to all people attending on Zoom, uh, you can use the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask questions uh, for the discussion at the end of, of, the, of the talk. Um, and so I then come to uh, today's topic. So uh, with the advent the development of the extremely brilliant source at ESRF, we have a considerable increase of of flux and this together with um, the development and use of uh, uh, new, new detectors of very high throughput, then uh, ESRF beamlines produce a very, very uh, impressive amount of data that uh, was uh, starting to become a very serious bottleneck for the uh, use of ESRF. And that's why uh, ESRF has uh, decided to create a group uh, dedicated to uh, uh, data analysis that uses a lot of uh, uh, machine learning. And uh, we, um, we, we then thought it would be very good to uh, introduce machine learning to uh, the broad scientific community of ESRF and other institutes of the EPN campus. And, um, and that's why uh, we're glad to have today as a speaker, uh, Professor James Crowley from uh, Grenoble Institute Polytechnique at Université Grenoble Alpes. Um, James Crowley uh, studied in the US and, and then uh, came to Grenoble in, um, uh, in the mid uh, 80s and uh, has been in Grenoble uh, since, so he did uh, all of his career. Uh, here uh, he is an expert of, um, of computer vision multimodal interaction robotics. And he was um, the head of the, of the group of uh, pervasive interaction at INRIA in, and uh, in, 19, uh, in 20, uh, 2019, he was uh, the appointed the head of the collaborative intelligence system at the uh, Grenoble App uh, Multidisciplinary AI Institute, MIE. And, um, he has received a number of uh, scientific distinctions. In particular, uh, he was uh, appointed a scientific member of the Institut Universitaire de France. And uh, in uh, 2014, I was uh, named uh, Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite. Uh, the talk of of James today will be entitled The Emergence of Machine Learning as a Rupture Technology for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, James, the floor, the floor is yours and we are eager to listen to your presentation. Okay, thank you, Bruno. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. You should see it now. Very good, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, yes, uh, in discussions with Patrick uh, in choosing a topic for this, um, Patrick indicated that, that it would be good to have a historical perspective about machine learning. And, and as someone who's been around for a long time and who lived through a lot of this, um, I was able to put together a story of, of what I experienced. It's a personal story. Um, I've got some math in there. I hope that's okay. Five of the slides have some equations. Um, there's really a backstory to the math and you don't need to read, read the equations. You can just listen to the words and hear the narrative that goes behind. It should be okay. Um, so as Patrick mentioned, um, I very recently retired in October and I'm currently Professor Emeritus from Grenoble BMP. That means that I am no longer allowed to teach students, but that I can have more free time to do research, which is actually not such a bad situation. Um, basically what I wanna talk about is the following. Um, the, a scientific community devoted to artificial intelligence was created in the 1950s. After a euphoric period in the 1980s, AI was declared dead. However, since 2010, the popular media are increasingly claiming 
that we're in an AI revolution. And in fact, there are a lot of signs that that could be true. There's a lot of new products are coming online. So what, what changed between 1980 and 2010? How did this dead failed science suddenly emerge to be such an earth-shaking human? That's basically the message of the next 50 minutes. So what I want to do is review in a little bit the evolution of AI from a pre-paradigm science into a more mature, not quite mature, but more mature science, and zoom in on uh, one particular technique called a perceptron um, that enables neural networks and how we can use that as a universal function approximation. Talk about how that can be used for things like uh, object detection and images, um, signal understanding, et cetera, with deep learning. Then, then talk about generative networks and autoencoders. And the current revolution that's emerged in the last three or four years are about transformers that have become possible because of that. And say a few words at the end about what happens next, where I think we'll go with that. But first, let me start by talking about intelligence. What do we mean by intelligence? There, there's not a complete consensus of what this means. But I think Turing gave us a pretty good definition. It's a behavioralist definition. Turing um, posed a test. Um, he said that if a human sitting at a terminal interacting with another agent that he couldn't see, couldn't tell whether it was a computer program or another human, then the program could be considered to be intelligent. Right? So it's human level performance at text-based interaction. Well, nowadays, nowadays we've uh, got tools that allow us to go beyond just interaction with text. We can start building systems that show human level performance of things like perception, action, communication, or interaction. So essentially what we're going to set as a bar for appreciating that a system and its behavior within an environment can be considered intelligent. And that is human level performance. Um, as some people in the field know, there are areas where you can go well beyond human level performance and others where we can't quite match the needs. But, but, that's, but, that's, but that's, that's stuff and solving hard problems. Um, as a scientific discipline, AI really traces its roots to a seminar or a symposium at Dartmouth in 1956, where a lot of the early pioneers all got together and decided to create a field. Um, it was a multidisciplinary field. We had people like Arthur Samuel, who had a, a checkers playing game that learned from its mistakes. So it learned to play checkers by playing checkers. Uh, John McCarthy, who organized the seminar but, and gave us the Lisp programming language, but also um, drew, drove AI into a uh, logic domain, insisted that anything that was intelligent had to be formalized as symbolic logic. Marvin Minsky, um, who gave us the frames representation and other knowledge representations that underlie much of cognitive science. Herb Simon, who came from psychology and economics, won a Nobel Prize in economics for his uh, combination of psychology and, and e economics. And Alan Newell, who uh, was often considered the, the father of modern planning. Um, these guys and uh, another 10 or so other scientists all got together at Dartmouth and spent a week, um, actually a few weeks if I remember correctly, trying to hash out what it would take to create a scientific discipline for artificial intelligence. Okay, drawing from cognitive science, logic, planning, pattern recognition, image processing, and other fields. One person they didn't invite was a guy named Frank Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt had this crazy idea of building this universal learning machine that would learn linear decision surfaces. He called it the perceptron. And the perceptron, well, he built one out of vacuum tubes, occupied a room. Uh, it had some problems. It could only classify patterns. That's all it did. Um, it only, in fact, was a binary classifier. It required labeled training data for supervised learning. And it required literally separable classes. You had to be able to put one class on one side of the surface and another on the other side. But if you had that, then it could learn to make any kind of a decision. At the time, people even called it the electronic brain. Okay? The data had to be separable. Yeah, if the data weren't separable, the algorithm wouldn't terminate, which was kind of a nuisance. Um, the field went through a number of paradigms um, up, up to the 60s. Pretty much the literature was dominated by automata theory and pattern recognition, um, partly thanks to Newell and his influence and other others in California. The 
um, field moved into planning and problem solving in the 1960s, and that was an important aspect in the 1980s. Uh, expert systems emerged in the late 70s, and it was a real revolution, driving um, AI in general towards symbolic reasoning. And um, in fact, I was a graduate student back then in the late 1970s and early 80s, and was able to make a lot of money by teaching people expert systems and doing consulting. So it was very, very hot at the time. Um, however, by the mid 80s to 90s, we suddenly kind of hit a barrier and AI lost its steam and became um, somewhat almost disreputable. Other places wouldn't teach it anymore. In the 1980s to 2000s, it was dominated by logic programming, fear improving. Um, from 95 on, Bayesian methods and the semantic web both emerged. But all along, through all those paradigms, there were three fundamental barriers. Insufficient tra labeled training data for supervised learning, insufficient computing power, and the prohibitive cost of encoding domain knowledge. What do I mean? Well, take, for example, the expert system. Okay, this was the big hot thing in 1980. The idea was that a domain expert sat down with a software engineer and encoded the domain expert's expertise in a computer program along with an inference engine. And that gave us a system that an end user could use for consulting. Okay, the, the classic example was an antibiotic therapy advisor made by Ed Feigenbaum, 1980 at Stanford. Um, this works, but turned out to be prohibitively costly. Encoding domain knowledge by hand, is something extremely expensive, and, and actually not very practical. So this more or less killed the idea of expert systems. By 1990, no one talked about them anymore. And parallel, about the same time, a small group of people continued to experiment with the perceptron. And there was a wave of popularity around something called artificial neural networks. And the story at the time was that symbolic computing was to totally incapable of solving some very simple problems like driving a car steering a robot, or recognizing an apple. And um, people showed that with relatively simple networks of perceptrons, you could do these things. Okay? And there were two main innovations that made it possible. One of them was not just having a single perceptron, which was shown to be quite limited, but having layers of perceptrons and using a soft decision surface. And the other was training the perceptron using a form of gradient descent training called backpropagation. This provided a simple and effective alternative to symbolic computing, which if it had been the dogma at the time, it just wasn't, wasn't working. So what do I mean? Well, the neuro artificial neural network, the, the first thing that really made it practical compared to the perceptron was to replace the hard decision surface. Um, let me, you know, I don't know if I, you can see my mouse. The hard decision surface um, with a soft sigmoid function, which was derivable. And this meant that we could use um, backpropagation, we could use gradient descent to come and try and tune the network parameters. Um, gradient descent actually used um, a number of lab labeled training data, M samples of data X, with indicator variables for ground truth Y, and essentially would tune the network parameters W and a bias B, so that the network would make the optimal decision. And um, if was possible to reformulate gradient descent as a first order iterative optimization. It, it is, gradient descent is the first order iterative optimization algorithm. We're just crunching through the data over and over until the parameters came to a minimum cost. Essentially what we're doing is we're estimating a cost function C and, and trying to drive that cost function as low as possible by tuning or adapting the weights. Well, what's powerful about all this is that well, if you express it by brute force, what you end up with is a series of recursive equations. You have the second layer of the network based on the first layer, the third layer, layer based on the second layer, et cetera, a big long recursive equation, but you don't need to compute it that way. You can break it up into a, simple, uh, a set of small linear equations and calculate it by propagating an active en activation energy through the network. This is called a Hebbian representation after a, a, a scientist named Hebb, who in the 1940s suggested we could do calculations as the human brain does. Okay? And this enables parallel computation. What it says is we can express the entire network as a single instruction, multi-data calculation 
and distributed over a large array of parallel elements. So instead of having to do one um, recursive equation, we could do a large number of small equations. Um, this forward propagation of activation energy can also be used for back propagation for implementing gradient descent. And let me show an example. Okay, this I promise there aren't going to there won't be that many mathematical equations here, but I'm going to do two right now, uh, two or three pages of, of equations. So consider this really simple network with two neurons. Okay, we've got a first neuron that takes an input x, multiplies it by w, and adds a bias, and takes that output, puts it into a second neuron where it's multiplied by w two, again added a bias, um, take it through a nonlinear decision, and then put an output. That, would be a recursive equation, except we're gonna do this, of course, with uh, propagation of activation energy. The gradient of a cost function C tells us how much we need to adapt each of the weights in the network in order to drive that cost down to zero or as small as possible. So we'll set up a cost function, which is just least squares error, calculate the derivative, and that'll tell us uh, for each, each of the terms, the, the derivative of the cost with respect to each of the parameters tells us how much to adapt that parameter. And that can be computed, of course, with a chain rule, but it's a big, hairy recursive equation again. So we've got this big, long chain rule in order to get the weights, in order to get the correction errors back to each of the weights. But we can break that down into a backwards flow of a correction energy, just as um, the forwards flow, the activation, the for feed forward network propagated an activation energy through the network from left to right. We then take the error that we got at the output and then propagate that back right to left as a correction term. And essentially breaking up that big long chain rule into lots of little equations, recursively calculating an error term delta, um, a delta for the second neuron from the output delta, a delta from the first neuron from the second neuron, and propagating that back through the network. So we can turn the learning phase also into a big single instruction multi-data calculation that we can put in parallel. Okay. Uh, this is the general form of those equations. Um, as we have to sum up errors from all of the um, outputs, but uh, it's a little messier because that's the network. But essentially what that says is we can break down the training network, just as we did to the cal forward calculation, as propagation of energy. We can propagate energy from left to right to go in and then propagate error back, back out. And all of this on large parallel computing. Um, however, however, um, that sounds great when you've got a simple network, but in reality, um, to do anything useful, you need a very large network and a very large collection of data. So it requires massive computing with massive data. Now, back in the 80s, we were talking about thousands of parameters. Uh, in, their, in the early 2000s, we were talking about hundreds of thousands. And today, we're talking about hundreds of millions of parameters in the network. Plus, we're training with very, very large data sets that are very noisy. That means our objective function is not this nice little concave quadratic that we saw a minute ago, but a kind of um, surface with lots of local minima. And our data set is a kind of liquid that's flowing over that surface. And what we're trying to do is to get that liquid to flow down to a local minimum in cost. And that'll be the best set of network parameters for whatever function we're running. So this turned out to be pretty handy in the 90s, in the 80s, because it enabled us to do some um, otherwise impossible things with computer vision and with robotics. However, there were some problems. Uh, for one, it was uh, unexplainable. It was a black box. You train it with some data, but you never quite got the same behavior. You train the same network with the same data and you get random things out. Um, most of the time it worked as long as the graduate student who built it was standing next to it. The graduate student graduated, the network no longer worked. Very difficult to reproduce, reproduce results. And the cost of learning grew exponentially with the number of layers and the number of neurons. So that kind of led the community to abandon a second time neural networks. By the late, 90, by the late 80s and early 90s, there were very few people still working on this. So people in machine learning basically abandoned it 
uh, for more sound Bayesian machine learning techniques. Uh, at that time also, there was a big schism in machine learning between people trying to do symbolic computing and learning for symbolic computing and people trying to do numerical computing. And in fact, that schism and that infighting in the community was one of the things that led the larger community to sort of declare that machine learning had died, had failed. I remember the European Commission at that time had a network of excellence that did fail and they actually stopped the project and stopped the funding. Three fundamental barriers, insufficient training data, insufficient computing power, and the prohibitive cost of encoding domain knowledge. So what's changed? Well, we've come, we've come to overcome those barriers. Insufficient training data, well, what we've got now is planetary scale data in the internet and the World Wide Web. We've also got realistic simulations. If you can build a very realistic simulator, you can train from the output on it and learn about phenomena and learn to recognize the phenomena um, with much, much less computing that it took to simulate the network. Now, for example, weather, you can, you can have, um, neural networks that recognize and detect phenomena in a weather pattern um, that don't require it to simulate in great detail all the, all the uh, underlying physics. Insufficient computing power. Well, Moore's law finally caught up. Um, we, we saw GPUs, graphical processing units, uh, arrive in the around 2005, 2006 area. And, and gradually it become available, became available massive parallel computing. And that allowed us to attack the problem of encoding knowledge with generalized deep learning. Using massive parallel computing and massive planetary scale data, we could start to get some pretty good results with deep learning with very deep networks. Well, what really triggered the revolution um, was the following. Um, back in the 1990s, uh, one of the persons who kept out neural networks and didn't give up was a French guy named Yann Lacoon. And Yan, unfortunately, because he, was, he did a PhD on neural networks, couldn't get a post in France. They ended up in New York teaching computer science um, at City College. But on the side, he kept playing with his networks and, and using them for small, simple computer vision problems. And in particular, he went after the problem of recognizing handwritten numbers using a data set provided by the National Bureau of Standards, now known as NIST. Um, and he won the competition. And, and produced a network uh, based on a number of innovations called a convolutional network. Um, he, he did a variety of these. One of them, his number five network, actually won the competition in 1994 and was later uh, actually used to implement machines for reading checks and also for reading postal codes on, on envelopes for the post office. However, he couldn't publish. The people in computer vision and machine learning just didn't want to hear about it. neural networks, Failed science doesn't work. Um, one of the innovations he had, and I need this box to explain some of the slides I'm going to show in a second, was to replace, um, first of all, to replace calculation over the entire signal with calculation over a small window. Okay, that's called a convolutional network. And what that does is greatly reduce the number of parameters that you need to learn because you're only learning a few weights for the window and greatly augment the amount of training data because now you, every small window in your image, for example, becomes a training sample. The other thing he did was to have not just one receptive field at each position, but multiple receptive fields, multiple small receptive fields. When you see a box like this here, um, what the third dimension of that box indicates is, is a, what we call the depth. And it's the number of different receptive fields learned at each position. Um, one of his colleagues, Alex Krzyznitsky, and his PhD advisor, Jeff Hinton, continued to play with networks like this. And in 2012, won by a very large competition, the large scale visual recognition challenge. Essentially what this was, was a yearly challenge where, where computer vision scientists had put images next to each of the words in WordNet, and then challenged people to recognize the word that goes with each image. So it was a small image recognition task. Um, up until 2011, it was pretty much, it was often dominated by people with either Oxford or uh, Grenoble. 
the Lear um, Xerox research team here in Grenoble, also the, the Xerox research team in Ria here in Grenoble. Um, in 2012, Alex Net won the competition dramatically, greatly reducing the error rate. And at that point, the computer vision community woke up and noticed that there was something. And from that point on, in 2013 and really 2014 on, the computer vision conferences started to be dominated by people using convolutional neural networks. One of my favorites um, was proposed by my colleague Andrew Zisserman at Oxford uh, called VGG, just named after his group, the Visual Geometry Group. Um, and it's a, uh, a very logical collection of very small windows. The innovation here was to use extremely small receptive fields and organize them in a very natural way. And this turns out to be a, a kind of workhorse for recognition. This, you can train this on an image net and then adapt it to almost any domain. It's very reliable for transfer learning. Um, another really interesting innovation in all this is something called YOLO. You only look once. And this poses the object detection problem as a single parallel regression, finding where an object is and what it is just by labeling small windows. Okay. And I mentioned this because it's an, a simple network, but it's also something that ST Microsystems is putting into uh, an ASIC right now. And so I understand that ST plans to actually commercialize a chip that does YOLO and something you can put um, in any camera or any, any kind of uh, well, your cell phone. Um, so all this is great for detecting things, but it's not the only thing you can do with these deep networks. Just as we can use networks for discrimination, we can also use them to generate patterns. So the networks were originally invented for discrimination and detection, but we can also use them to generate patterns. We can generate natural sounding speech, natural language, synthetic images, robot animation, and we can make deep fake, realistic talking heads, for example. And the key to this is something called the autoencoder. Well, the audio encoder um, actually uses uh, a network like this to generate a clean code for a no from a noisy input. Okay. It learns to reconstruct or generate clean copies of the data. And what's interesting is it, it can work with unsupervised learning. It doesn't require label training data. The training data is the target. The error between the reconstruction and the original image is the cost function. And it's just going to drive the weight so as to minimize that cost function, squeezing it down through a kind of code. Now, initially, the autoencoder was used back in the 1980s as a, a way of generating or as a way of experimenting with backpropagation. We recall Jeff Hinton couldn't find labeled training data to work out the backpropagation algorithm. So he just used the reconstruction problem, um, essentially doing a form of principal components analysis. This is really great because when you look at the principal components analysis equation, they require matrix inversion. So that limits the size of the data you can work with. But if you formulate that as a heavier network, well, you can, you can use any size network just as long as you have enough data, as long as you have enough computing power. So the autoencoder, essentially what we do, um, we're going to add to the cost function, reconstruction error, plus a sparsity term that tries to force um, each of these um, code elements to be independent of the others. So that if I put uh, numbers in here, I'll have a code for one, another code for two, and another code for three. And if I put in a noisy two, um, what I'll get out is a clean two on the other side. I learned to generate a clean copy. And when I look at the code vector, one of the elements is lit up and all the others are zero. The data is forced to a sparse coding uh, using information theory. Uh, we can do some really interesting things with this. You know, one of them is the variational audio autoencoder. Um, normally, the autoencoder learns discrete classes, but if we do this properly, we can learn probabilities and represent them as mean and standard deviation and use them to reconstruct um, small imagets that look like the original image. For example, in this case, I can animate a dancer um, who may or may not have clothes on with a, a clothes dancer, I can put in one person dancing and show another person doing the same dance moves. Um, same thing with talking. I can put in one person talking here and show another person saying the same thing here. 
And in fact, it's used that way for deep fake. And with a techni technique like this, you can generate um, an image of someone talking um, animated by someone else talking. And the lip movements and the face expressions are the same, but it's not the same face. Another thing you can do is put a discriminator as a judge to a generator and have the two compete with each other. The generator trying to fool the discriminator and the discriminator trying to tell when the generator is fooling. And each, each time one or the other makes an error, it, it, it refines the weights of the first. So this actually um, has been used for, for, to learn. And, and what's, what's amazing about this is you can continue running it um, as long as you've got computing. So you basically set up these two systems fighting each other and each one correcting the other. And as long as you keep, keep throwing computing power at it, it just keeps getting better and better at realizing deep fake images or realistic speech synthesis or realistic images. But there's another thing this autoencoder allows us to do. And that's what we call self-supervised learning. Essentially, this is a form of unsupervised learning where once again, the data is its own ground truth. And what we train the network to do is to replace missing parts and to predict the next output called missing token replacement and next token prediction. In missing token replacement, if I've got missing parts of the letter two here, for example, <laughs> it'll fill them in. Um, if I have a word and I garble one of the letters so that you can't see that letter, but you see the other letters, you can essentially reconstruct the missing letter from the context. Um, if I have speech and I mispronounce a word, I can reconstruct the mispronounced syllable or the mispronounced word from the context to word. I can use this to learn context and reconstruct. The next thing I can do is associate the next output. So if I have a numerical sequence, one, two, I can learn to expect three. Um, I can do this with number sequences, of course, but I can do it pretty much with any signal, is learn to predict what's coming next. And I can do that with text, et cetera. And I can do it over time and at multiple levels of abstraction. So one of the things that this has been used for is encoding text. Well, for example, we could take the text, this is a phrase, and train it by masking out parts of this is a phrase, say this a phrase, this is phrase, et cetera, and have the system replace the missing part, put an output, which is the complete phrase. But we can also have it take individual words, put them all together and spit out a sentence. We can take individual letters, put them all together and spit out a word. We can take sequences of sentence and spit out a paragraph. And from that abstract a kind of code meaning which encodes the signal that came in. We can capture the meaning of a word or the meaning of a sentence, et cetera. Um, these are called recurrent networks. Um, the, most of the tools for recurrent networks are extremely expensive to compute and very unstable, but, but the technology has been making some rapid progress. One of the interesting innovations that emerged from these kinds of networks was the use of something called attention. With attention, essentially what we do is we can take those latent variables, those code vectors from previous times, and we can attach a kind of key for looking them up associatively, and then put in a query and just by matrix multiplication or by activation, by Hebbian calculation, go back and associate a current um, uh, hidden code vector with previous code vectors in a sequence and learn which parts of the sequence were relevant. This is called attention um, and, and has turned out to be a major revolution for, for first of all, text and natural language and more recently for all of machine learning. In particular, in 2017, people at Google showed that you could stack sequences of the encoders together to get more and more abstract representations from a signal and look at them with attention from a sequence of decoders to get back to the original kind of signal. And this is what's well, widely used for um, things like internet search, but also for machine language translation. And if you go to Google Translate, this is the way Google Translate works or deep L. In fact, there, there are stories of graduate students who, um, German graduate students who, who write their doctoral thesis in poor low-class German, 
translated to English with DeepL and then translated back to German and get high class German um, using this kind of technology. Essentially, attention associate words in a sentence in order to provide context. And when you do this with words, typically, or with a sentence, you typically have multiple heads that look at different aspects of the sentence, the verb, the subject, the object, modifiers. And, and you can get multiple contexts that way to associate the words. Um, tokens associated with self-attention um, really have become the dominant approach in the last few years for natural language processing. But they're also turning out to be extremely useful for multimodality because we can associate with words with images. We can learn that a bowl has a certain shape and look for that shape and we see the word bowl. We can look for pink. We can look for yogurt. We can look for other food, type, food types. Using essentially self-attention as an association mechanism. Um, and this has started to replace um, deep networks and uh, in particular started to replace convolutional networks and recurrent networks for things like speech recognition and computer vision. In fact, there's a shift underway in my own field, computer vision right now, towards more and more the use of transformers. One particular architecture that I think is really cool that showed up last year here in Grenoble was the episodic transformer, which essentially associates what a robot is doing now, not just with the spoken commands and with the goals it's trying to accomplish and the computer vision, but with what it did in the past. So you have essentially a, a history of the robot operations associated with the current operation, associated with what the robot currently sees and is trying to do. So what happens next? Where do we go from here? Well, um, as uh, Niels Bohr said, um, predictions are always difficult, especially about the future. Or, or was it Yogi Berra who said that? Or maybe it was Mark Twain. It's one of those quotes that lots of people um, are, are associated with. So really the question is, what domains are most suitable for economic and societal rupture from AI technologies? Well, Kai Fu Lee, um, who was one of my colleagues as a graduate student, and he's now gone back to China and taken a high position in China, wrote a book a few years ago uh, called AI Superpowers. And in that book, his slogan was, AI is the fire, data is the fuel. If you want to predict innovation from AI, look for the data. And in, the, in that book, uh, Kai proposed five waves of rupture from innovation with AI. Um, his first wave was the internet AI and AI as a service. And this is pretty much happening now especially with the emergence of GPT-3 and, and BERT and others, uh, people are waking up to the idea that you can have massive computing using cloud computing, offering AI services online, and, and people can use those using the internet. The next wave, which he predicted, was enterprise AI. And it, it turns out that many corporations in America moved to digital records back in the 1980s and have uh, 30, 40 years of recordings of their activities all digital, stored, private, that they can data mine um, and use to optimize and streamline their operations and become more efficient. Um, another amazing source of data are mobile phones. Um, mobile AI using smartphones. And in fact, uh, mobile uh, smartphones in general are enormous vacuum cleaners for, for data. They produce prestigious amounts of data and associated with, uh, with uh, machine learning, can learn an awful lot about a person, their context, and their activities. Um, from there, Kai predicted that we'll move more and more towards ubiquitous perception and interaction systems, you know, cameras that do face recognition in public, which we're already seeing too many of, um, and other devices where, where computer vision and AI sort of provide a gateway for services in public or in private. And from there, autonomous systems, things like self-driving cars, and, and home robots. And Kai argued that the US, China, and Europe were unevenly positioned to profit from each wave based on the availability of data, pointing out that uh, because there was no such thing as privacy in China, it was much easier to snarf up everybody's data from their cell phone and do machine learning on it. Uh, whereas much more difficult in Europe to do that, fortunately, 
I mean, U.S. There's a much larger record of enterprise data, so you can do enterprise AI, etc. So this is the competition we in Europe are in right now. Okay. Um, my personal take on this um, is that when you talk about innovation with AI, remember this is human level performance at interaction. We can talk about interaction with people, interaction with the physical world, interaction with systems, and interaction with information. With people, we can talk about education, using AI for entertainment, for healthy living, interaction with the physical world for robotics, transportation, manufacturing, for systems with smart buildings, smart cities, smart roads, and with information in the form of a virtual personal assistant, for example, that can be your web agent and go find information for you on the internet, help you with travel planning, or help you with any kind of access to large bodies of, of uh, information. Um, for this, in our research team, we proposed three categories of interactive systems. We called them effectors, media, and advisors. Effectors inspire affection. Medias extend human perception and experience. And advisors propose courses of actions that are completely obedient. They don't act, they just advise. But effectors using a technique called reinforcement learning, which turns out to work very well with deep learning, can learn to recognize and inspire affection. And already this is done with some forms of elderly care robots, um, such as the payroll robot that's on the right here. Um, and it's an active research area, learning how to see whether a system is pleasing somebody and learning how to adapt its behavior so that it's more pleasing or has a better effect. And of course, you can learn any kind of uh, emotional stimulation, including how to make somebody mad. Um, media. Um, well, we saw currently with artificial, we've seen with uh, augmented reality technology, and we can display information that's pre-programmed, but we can go way beyond that. We can fuse the virtual with real. And I think this is what Meta, the previous Facebook company, is trying to get to. And combining AI and machine learning, where you overlay information with uh, the real world, and uh, not just information, but also simulations of what can happen, projections of the future, projections of possibility. And, and um, well, the sky's the limit. What I'm really interested in right now are advisors using cognitive computing. The idea here is that we can take a domain uh, with a collection of textbooks or the internet, use, serving as domain knowledge, and use that to train a transformer in order to make a domain expert that can then advise the user. And be useful for questions like, what are the key references to read about such and such? Or has anyone published data on this phenomenon? Okay, um, this is already becoming possible. There's a number of examples. OpenAI created a, a transformers based system called GPT-3, which turns out to be extremely powerful. And, and among the things it's been used for is writing agents that can write their own computer code. Um, and they, they made it available to several thousand developers, uh, one of them got a hold of it to build a digital copy of a lost friend. Basically, this uh, Russian computer scientist had lost her very close friend for which she had many years of ex email exchanges, um, et cetera. And she trained it to make a replica uh, of her friend. And she created a startup to do this and uh, put it online with a nice virtual rendering. And, and now it's a product and you can play with it and it takes on different personalities and it's really quite engaging. I mean, it, and it works to engage you and to please you. Um, and as I said, we can encode knowledge from any written source, textbooks, the literature, even the internet to generate domain expert advisors, for medical, for legal, for financial, for scientific. Okay. One of my dreams would be to use this for scientific literature for areas that are not my specialty, but which, for which I need to keep track of what's happening. Um, machine learning, for example, okay? where I could take the latest scientific publications, uh, put them on top of a pre-trained transformer that keeps up with them, and then I'll be able to ask questions like, um, uh, has anybody published anything new on such and such, or uh, what's the latest result? What's the best reference for such and such? Such an advisor would not discover new concepts, but it could provide a tool to augment human intelligence. 
which more or less brings me to, to what my current chair at the uh, um, AI Institute is on, the Collaborative Intelligence Systems. Collaboration is a process where two or more actors work together to achieve some shared goal. And what we're interested in is the case where one of the actors is a human and one of the actors is a machine. We'd like to have machines and people work each together, each enhancing the abilities and bringing in their unique abilities um, to, to build something that's to work on a common goal. Uh, for this, um, with our colleagues in the European network, we formulated a roadmap, which is a kind of layered roadmap of different sorts of abilities. Um, the challenge is to build systems. Well, we, we know at the reactive level, pretty much today, how to build natural language exchanges, how to have conversational agents, um, how to do that with vocal and with, with spoken language, as well as written text. Um, those systems are just starting to become aware of their situation. So we can take situation models from cognitive psychology and, and start to put some intelligence. And using the literature from the planning theory, we can do simple operations, um, making up plans to accomplish things. But we really don't know how to get a hold of the practical knowledge that people have, to be able to have human experts explain their expertise and procedures for how to get things done. And we're still far from being able to be really have systems that are really creative, that can create new answers. So we've laid out this roadmap of increasingly difficult problems in a layered system, and we're looking at techniques at each of those different layers. So um, I know I, I realized I was speaking fast there for a while. Uh, we're coming right up on 50 minutes. So, so let me cut to the chase with some conclusions. Essentially, the messages were the following. Intelligence is human-level performance at interaction whether it's interaction with another human, physical world, systems, or information. Machine learning has revolutionized artificial intelligence. It's a rupture technology that made previous techniques obsolete. Machine learning is made possible by access to large volumes of data, planetary scale data, and massive scale computing using graphical processing units, ter uh, tensor processing units, and ASICs. And one of the big recent advances has been transformers, which are stacked autoencoders trained with self-supervised learning. Um, and they open up all recorded literature to artificial intelligence. Um, they can provide a technology for building effectors, things that influence our emotions, media, things that allow us to see things in a new way, and advisors, things that give us easy interactive access to information. And in general, for AI, if AI is the fire, data, data is the fuel. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim, for the very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, really exciting. Uh, so uh, I invite uh, all participants to send in their questions via the question and answer box. Uh, we may also take questions from the panelists, Vincent, Annalisa, or Uli. Um, maybe I start with a question that I, see, I read from Rémi Perenon. How can you test or validate benchmarks AI system to ensure correct behavior and especially to avoid overfitting? Do you think that could be a major limitation uh, to the sort of common usage of AI, like um, vehicles? Right, right. The, the, the standard technique when you're training a network um, is to take your training data set and divide it into three chunks. That you have your basic training data that you're learning with. You have a validation set, which you don't train on, but you use to, to guide the training. And then you have your test set at the end, which measures um, how good you're doing. And I tell my students uh, uh, dividing something like uh, 70, 20, and 10. Okay, use 10% for the test, 20% for validation, and 80% for training, but you can divide it up different ways. And essentially what you do is you look at the cost metric, or you look at uh, other error rates, uh, accuracy, as you go through the training data over and over again. Each time, each pass through the training data is called an epoch. And as you do multiple epochs, you'll see these scores 
of the evaluation set and the test set, uh, the evaluation set and the training set both go down. At some point, the score of the training data will continue to descend and the evaluation set will go back up. When you see that divergence, that means you're overfitting. Okay. Um, that, that's in the middle of lecture seven of my AI course, and I can pull up the slide from my course notes and, and show you some examples of when those curves diverge. But that's a standard technique to know when you're overfitting is to have some data in reserve that you're using to, to, to see whether you're continuing to improve on data you haven't trained on. And of course, at the end of the day, you take a third set and you measure the performance of your network on that third set. Now, these are all techniques for supervised learning. Um, I guess I'd have to think a minute about how to, how to do this with self-supervised learning. Um, what would it mean to overfit? I guess overfit for self-supervised learning would be something like a specialist who only knows his own domain and not other domains. That's a, that's a, a more general topic and more at the edge of, of the science. But did that answer the question? I think so, yes. Uh, so we have a question from Henry Fisher. When do you think such AI system will also incorporate the capacity to initiate self-motivated actions? Ooh, self-motivation. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, well, that's a whole different system. <laughs> okay, what motivates humans? Um, basically, our biology, our appetites. Um, we have genetic needs. We're, we're motivated, first of all, by um, homeostasis, trying to maintain uh, stability of our immediate environment. We're trying to maintain our energy, homeostasis of our energy flow. But we get hungry. Uh, we sleep. Okay. All of these things are motivators. And then we have biological needs that go beyond that, um, things like mating, uh, continuing the species, et cetera. Okay. None of that are programmed into our artificial intelligences. So they don't have those motivations. They don't have a need uh, for eating or sleeping. They don't have a need to take over the world, okay? There's no need to dominate. Um, now, that said, if you understand the computational mechanism behind it, you could eventually do that. And certainly there's nothing legal that stops somebody from trying to do that with a intelligent robot when you get sufficient level of intelligence, but it's a separate system, okay? It's a different question than trying to just be able to interact at human level performance. But, but it's a debate, I mean, we could, we could talk about you know, what does it really require to do intelligence? And, and do we have to put these kinds of appetites into the systems for them to be really human level at the interactions? I mean, maybe we need to put jealousy and love into our computers for them to be truly human level. I don't know. Thank you. Um, well, I, I'd like to, to ask you a question. Um, my understanding, please correct if I'm grossly misunderstanding or caricaturing uh, AI or and machine learning uh, is that in some sense, this is a very sophisticated and uh, way of interpolating uh, among the, the data that have been used for training. And uh, um, what if the system is then asked to recognize something that was completely never seen um, and uh, to recognize it as significant? Uh, for scientific discovery, that would be very important to, to have some criteria to detect some singular events that are uh, significant and not just uh, statistical errors and things like that. Is there any chance of... There, there, are, many ways that? To answer that. there are many ways to answer that question. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm looking for a slide. And, and you, could, you could, in a sense... Um, Okay, you, you could, in a sense, say uh, the, the, the systems that are doing these kinds of detection are, are just nice interpolation systems. But um, beyond that, what we're talking about doing right now are making hierarchies of, hierarchies of abstractions. Yeah. Okay, and, and where at the lowest level, you're talking about collecting letters into words, you know, numbers, digits into numbers, and then collecting words into sentences and then collecting sentences into paragraphs and paragraphs into chapters and chapters into books, okay? And, and cross-associating words with other words and sentences with other sentences and sentences with words, et cetera, and, and the ideas. 
Um, so when you go to do that, when you've trained a system on a particular set of concepts and a particular set of words, and you feed it on a different domain, well, it's either going to try and reconstruct what it knows or it's going to be lost. So I guess I'd never, I hadn't thought of calling it a, a sophisticated interpolation system, but I, in a sense, I guess that makes sense. It's a multi-concept. Uh, uh, Something that has never been seen cannot yeah. be learned. But uh, no, what, no, no, no. Okay. Is there we, any way of having to intuition uh, in AI? AI being intuitive. Sure, sure. And, and, guess and no, that that's make the reasonable yeah, guess yeah. that something never seen is actually significant. Yeah, in a well, okay. Again, again, what what does it mean by something and seen? Um, if it's in the same kind of phenomena that we've seen in the past, that's not a problem. I build networks that, that recognize handwritten digits in forms they've never seen before. That works easy. Um, when you're talking about abstract concepts or classes, okay, yeah, here's a way of answering that question. Up until recently, most of our training has been with um, supervised learning which means you can only learn a fixed, finite set of class, predefined classes. And if you feed it something from a class that's not one of those predefined classes, you can't recognize it. With transformers, we're trying to open that up, self-supervised learning, and to have extensible classes. That is to say, the system can learn to recognize new phenomena. So certainly for, self, for supervised learning, you can only recognize what you've been trained on. The, the challenge is to go beyond that. And, and I'm not going to say we can do it, but I think we have, I think we have some ways to do it now with what we're doing. So how about that for an answer? Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, Uli Kuster from Ireland has raised his hand and maybe would like to ask a question. Yes. Yes, please. So um, you gave a nice example of this translation from German to English and English back to German, which improves it. But that is because there's a lot of training data which has now improved this algorithm. If you would Precisely. use a very exotic language where actually the web-based data is now mainly automatic translations from English or French or whatever texts, the ratio might be very different. And yep. then how do, I mean, it is a bit related between this practical problem and up to the deep fake. Would you have um, algorithm which can detect if a product, a produced text, uh, whatever output is coming from some human or if it is evidently built by uh, AI? I'm looking actually for uh, a slide that I took out on reinforcement learning. Okay, so certainly, yes, let me summarize. You're completely correct. Um, if we're learning translation from a language to another language where we have lots of data in both languages and, and lots of translations, yeah, we can do pretty good. Um, when we've got a, a language with very sparse data available, the translations won't be very good. And what we're reduced to is interacting with people and learning from the interactions. So one way to go at that is reinforcement learning. Okay. And with reinforcement learning, uh, essentially we're learning what we call a policy, which when we see something in the environment, it generates a new action. And we learn those policies through doing the action and rewarding or penalizing whether the action is the right thing through interacting with the environment. So probably if you're trying to work with a new language or with some um, obscure African tribe who doesn't have a written history and just an oral tradition, the best way to learn would be to interact with a member of the tribe using something called deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so we could go ahead. That, 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 that is how to do it perfectly, but for today's web-based algorithms, which might run in the wrong direction by training on their own generated data, do you have an independent method to check the output? The is, is so testing. Means, can, do you have an algorithm which would have the capability to, to make this Turing um, decision if on the backside is a human or a, a machine? Yeah, actually, in a sense, hold on, let me get another slide here. You find it. In a sense, that's what this does. Okay, general, general adversarial network. 
Now, as you rightly said a second ago, um, the generator is training the discriminator and the discriminator is training the generator and they can get lost in a loop and hyper-specialize on each other and, and kind of disconnect from reality. But you can also substitute uh, other discriminators. You can put a human into the loop from time to time and try and bring the system back to, to reality. Um, or, or you can essentially pre-train with uh, artificial systems and then put a human into the system to try and refine it to a particular um, social context. So that would be the best way that I would go at what you're suggesting. But, but again, you know, these are, these are hard, interesting problems. Okay, thanks. Um, we can go back to questions from the, uh, from the audience. And there is an interesting question from Jody Sempere. What would be the steps to follow in order to use AI to help scientists configure faster experimental setups in a research infrastructure? Right, right. As you're talking to the, the, the AI Institute Chair on Collaborative Intelligence Systems. So that's the kind of problem that we try and work on. And uh, again, let me share a screen that, that'll illustrate the answer that I would give to that question. But let me say that it's a research domain, okay? And right now there are some hard problems we don't quite know how to solve, okay? That's what this is about, okay? So when you say, when you talk about, um, setting up your experiment more faster, normally what you're talking about is what we call practical or practical knowledge, expertise, okay? based on experience. Okay? By using your very complicated um, experimental setup, which has a lot of phenomena that you didn't anticipate when you build it, you basically learn how to do it, work effectively with it. And that's called expertise. What we would like is to be able to take that expertise down into a, a artificial system that can operationally configure your system. We'd like to be able to do artificial operations with human expertise. That means being able to translate or communicate the expertise from the human to the system. And that is exactly the research problem that we're working on in Humane AI Net and in my chair, Collaborative Intelligence Systems. We're trying to be able to take, for example, explanations or instructions or demonstrations and use them so that expertise is compiled into operational knowledge um, for uh, choosing the right tasks, which we can then use to determine the actions for the configuration. Okay, that would be my answer. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Ewen Belek uh, about uh, ethical issues uh, related with machine learning and uh, and, and, and the question of unethical use uh, that might happen in the future. Uh, right. What's your take on this? Well, I, I think it's a very uh, organized. It, it's a real danger. Okay, this is a real danger. These are tools, okay? And, and you can do ethical or unethical use for them, just like you can do ethical or unethical use for an airplane or with, a, with a, an atomic bomb or, or any, kind of, any kind of technology. Um, so first of all, it's the ethics of the, the person who builds and deploys the system you have to worry about. However, beyond that, what do we mean by ethics? And my personal take is that um, ethics reflect values, which are things I'm willing to sacrifice for, for trade between each other. I, I value money, but I also value my privacy. I'm willing to pay money for privacy. I value my freedom. I'm willing to pay money for freedom. But my values are based in a large sense on principles, okay, things I have discovered to be true either through scientific experimentation or from reading great masters or from mathematical demonstration or whatever. And to some extent, I, I base my choice of values on those principles. Okay. And if I can do that in a rational way, as I've just described, systems could probably be brought to do that as well. If we could get our systems to behave, um, to respect our values, and, and build systems that intrinsically respect the values, then we can go a long way to avoiding having the systems be ethically abused. And I think that is one of the things that we're trying to do at the level of the European Commission, uh, European Union. Um, unfortunately, there was a misguided effort last year to try and create a legal restriction on what people could and could do with AI. And the whole effort 
to my mind, broke down because they couldn't get a clear definition of what they meant by AI. And what they defined actually turns out to be anything with information technology. So it's a question of what can you do or not do with information technology, and then it just got a, it became a real mess. But we need to be clear what, what we mean by ethics, first of all, um, what we allow each other to do with the systems, and then what we allow to go into the system so that when the systems make autonomous behaviors that they respect our values. But that's why it's important that society is well informed about what AI can and what AI cannot in order to be able to determine what AI should do or not do. Um, Absolutely. And, and how we should or not should, you, should yeah. not use AI. Okay. Uh, maybe slightly different, but also quite uh, relevant for society question is, um, can you comment on the energy footprint with the, uh, associated with the use of AI and whether that's going to be a limiting factor to the expansion of AI for many purposes or whether it's a real, it's a real problem right now. Progresses. Yeah, one of the reasons it's a real problem right now is that most of machine learning is being done with graphical processing units, which are extremely energy Um Google has increasingly moved to building uh, ASICs, specialized integrated circuits called uh, tensor processing units, which are much more energy efficient. Okay, and they deploy them in cloud computing facilities, but still the quality, quantity of energy that's gone into training some of the high-end transformer systems is just phenomenal. I mean, it's really scary in terms of the equivalent of, of how many um, thousands of miles you would drive in your car compared to training the system. So yes, it is a real problem. Ultimately, the, the answer will be specialized hardware that directly implement the Hebbian activation energy propagations. Uh, after all, what we're trying to get at is a computing device that works by spreading activation here in the head and is quite energy effective. I mean, it, it takes a lot of energy from the human body, but nothing near on the order of what deep learning does. So um, part of the answer is going to be getting the effective hardware, and that's an active area of research, including in Grenoble, the AI Institute. I've got colleagues that do that. But right now, today, the amount of energy that went into transforming, went into learning or training GPT-3 or BERT or any of the high-end transformers is just scandalous. And, and we're seeing more and more of that energy being used for machine learning type training applications. And my students, uh, they're, they're using much more carbon to, to learn their AI course than they learn driving to and from campus. But no. we'll get there. Is the, the biggest chunk of the energy necessary related to the to the training or to the use of, of the AI once the training, the training and the learning has been done? Absolutely to the training. Okay, um, because we, we talk about hundreds and even thousands of epochs of going through massive data sets. So the amount of computing that's being used for training some of these systems is just phenomenal. Um, of course, if you get a killer application and everybody's running that application, it can start to have a footprint as well. So it depends on what you use it for afterwards. Yes, but the scaling is quite different then. Yeah, yeah the scaling is quite different. And, and this is something we saw even before neural networks. I mean, the face detector that you have in your cell phone is based on um, a, a, a simpler technique. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it. I've teach, I teach it. I mean, well, anyway, it's a simpler technique. The, the training for that face detector uh, took three months back in 2000. But they patented the code once it was done. And then people put it in cell phones and the actual execution for the code is very simple. Okay. Um, it, it's done with, um, well, okay, I'm not gonna go into a lecture about how to do a face detector. Okay. Essentially many, many cases, the training way outweighs the application. Okay, uh, let's take a, a last question. And that's a question I, uh, uh, say from Henry Fisher, um, do you agree with Schopenhauer's debunking of free will? Uh, who wrote, although one does not, one does what one wants to, one cannot choose what one wants. So, <laughs> this is a philosophy question, not an yeah, AI yeah. question. Uh, yeah. All right, but I, that's okay. That's okay. I studied philosophy. We can debate free will. Um, there's a lot of random stuff that happens in the human brain. Okay? And, and a lot of what we call free will is actually justification for what we did 
for other reasons. Okay, um, there's a there's a lot going on in our behaviors that's unconscious, and and a lot of what we call free will or choice is, is often just trying to justify what we ended up doing for biological reasons. Um, we, we invent narratives that explain phenomena that we observe afterwards and including the phenomena of our own behavior. Um, so what, what did Schopenhauer say? Um, I lost the quote. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, it, it was removed. Maybe you need to- It was removed, it, it scrolled up. Uh, it's unfortunate. I, not it's censored, but- uh, you, if you tick uh, answer, then you will find it. Uh, but uh, okay, maybe we, we can uh, leave it at it uh, now for now. And uh, we should uh, thank James again for uh, this uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation and uh, following discussion. And uh, so I invite uh, everyone to join us for uh, next events. And I uh, wish you all a, a good afternoon and a nice weekend. Let, let me close by saying I will put yes. the slides and the recording on my own personal website as well. So if someone wants to download the, the PDF from the slides and read them slower, because I spoke much too fast trying to the, fit into 15 minutes. Yes, so the, the talk will be available for replay on, uh, uh, on YouTube. And there we shall also put a link to your slides. So then everyone will have access to. Right. And, and you can just Google me, type Google James L. Crowley and, and I show up and you can find my website.